Hello there, Booktube. My name is Daniel. Welcome back to my channel, Guilty Feet. I've got no rhythm. Uh, today I'm going to do a recent reads catch up of a bunch of things that I've read. Uh, graphic novel in there as always, so apologies for that. Those of you who find that tedious, uh, but some uh, other books as well that might be interesting. Uh, let's start with this, I guess, is a kind of uh, March Mystery Madness uh, add-on. This was uh, Down Cemetery Road by Mick Heron. So I've been all in on the Jackson Lamb series with the, and there's two seasons of the Apple TV show Slow Horses based on those books. I've lent them to people. I've been evangelizing for Mick Heron for a while. I came, I bought that first one secondhand when I was looking for new spy books, like doing a search and it got suggested and I bought um, uh, uh, um, uh, Slow, what was the first one? The first one was Slow Horses. Uh, um, I bought it from Awesome Books, had it delivered, and then it rapidly ate up the rest of the series. This is uh, um, an earlier series that he wrote. Now, I I don't always find I have success when I find a, an author and tap into a vein that I'm really enjoying. It's not always the smartest thing to go back and read the stuff they wrote before their big breakout hit. But I've had such a thrill with Heron. I was on a, um, uh, during pandemic, I was on a, uh, a Zoom thing with him, and he's, I got sent a copy of. Uh, I I bought a signed copy of one of his books, and uh, and it's all great. Uh, um, so I thought I'd go back, and this is say an earlier series. This is I think there are four books in this, and the detective is a female protagonist called Zoe Bohm. So I thought, listen, I ordered the first two. I'll see what happens, and if I like them. So this is the first one, Down Cemetery Road. Actually, it's not about Zoe at all. So she's a minor character in this. And there is a another protagonist, also a female protagonist, uh, who gets mixed up in all sorts of shenanigans, uh, um, uh, um, spy stuff. So there is sort of a, a dark uh, British intelligence involved uh, trying to cover things up. And, and she uh, decides that she is going to get involved and uncover it. And um, um, things ensue, uh, uh, mostly plot. Uh, um, there are some deaths. There are some uh, really... Uh, um, sort of uh, icky, gruesome bad guys who do bad things to people, and uh, whether it's believable or not, it, it it rips along at a fair pace and made me excited to read more of these. So as I said, this is a rare success. We're going back to read um, uh, earlier work by a, a novelist that uh, is uh, is performing in their prime. Uh, I think has been has been uh, yeah, opened up a new avenue for me. So I got this one. I've got the second one. I'm going to probably at some point uh, um, order the third and fourth one. And I've also got a collection of short stories which has both the Jackson Lamb from the Slough House and and Zoe and her husband uh, um, uh, in that as well called Dolphin Junction, which I picked up um, over Christmas. So more to come from Mick Heron, and that's just great because uh, uh, everything he's written so far I have thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, then after that, I read uh, The Prime Minister by Anthony Trollope. I just posted a whole video on that yesterday. Uh, um, it's 900 plus page book, uh, the fifth in the Palace series. Had a great uh, fun with it. Took me about a week to get through. So that's, this is about the last two weeks worth of reading. After um, I finished that, I uh, um, uh, treated myself to um, uh, a graphic novel that I had sitting on my shelf for a year. I bought this uh, um, on Boxing Day 2021 in the Barnes & Noble in Union Square in New York City, where we were visiting for my nephew's wedding. And they just had their first child. So, uh, uh, and the wedding was 15, 16 months ago. And they just uh, had a baby boy. The bris is today, I think, uh, in uh, New Jersey. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I picked this up. Half price was a half price sale in Barnes & Noble on Boxing Day. Uh, um, so this should have been, this is from, this is Something is Killing the Children. This is the deluxe edition. Um, so this is the first three collections. So of the first 15 issues. So 15 monthly issues of a comic comes out. Every five issues, they collect them into little trade paperbacks. Um, and this is a, uh, um, the first three of those in outsize. Look at this side. This is a, a hardback book, and this is the size of this thing. So this is bigger. The pages are bigger than they would have been in the original comic. And this is the first 15 issues. I was super excited to read this. This was cover price $50, so I got it for $25, which I was really excited about that. Um, uh, and it's been enormous hype. If you know anything about the comic world, this book has been a huge breakout success. Every new issue, there are a, 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 a more than a handful of variant covers so that the resale market is still very strong. Uh, you're trying to get a first print or, or a variant edition or a second print. It, it, it's still the back issues of the, of the actual comic are uh, um, uh, very much sought after and increasing in price and a lot of hype around this. So 
I would say I understood it. it it's sort of horror inflected, if you can't tell from the from the cover of this. This is our main protagonist. Her name is Erica Slaughter. Uh, actually her name uh, um, and uh, um, and uh, he's covered in blood and wielding huge knives and the title something is killing the children so not necessarily uh, the first thing that I would jump to and I probably wouldn't have picked this up had I seen this in, in the comic strip but I was still buying comics every week from my comic store I wouldn't have bought this first issue because it looks a bit creepy uh, but with all the hype I thought I'd pick it up and uh, disappointed um, you know so I've got 15 issues here which is uh, uh, those 15 issues are, are all one connected story. So we get the whole of that, this first um, um, tale of um, um, something happening to the children of a town called Archer's Peak. And mysterious young lady uh, turns up on the uh, uh, and says she knows what's happening to the children and she can fix it. Um, and then we get a whole load of world building and who she's from and the secret organization and their, their ties to government and law enforcement and, and uh, the monsters and... Uh, but a lot of it is is deeply derivative stuff we've seen before. You know, evil monsters being created from the mind of a child, uh, um, uh, secret conspiracies to uh, uh, protect the public from knowing that monsters exist or they would lose their shit. Uh, um, and in the middle of this, some sort of very gruesome, bloody deaths. You know, and it's fine. I don't mind the, the gruesome and the bloodness when you see a, a child's body, a child body being ripped apart by monsters that have been created out of the imagination and the fear but manifested in real life but the body being ripped in half and entrails and things okay that's nasty gruesome i know some people uh, have that, that that doesn't bother me my problem with horror is always the suspense part not the gore part um, um and that's the first time you see the body being pulled apart is like oh wow this is really going there and and uh, and shocking and and uh, and uh, you know uh, um but the second third fourth fifth and sixth time a body is pulled apart or a, 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 a monster's limb is thrust through the middle of a thing or you see some entrails or blood drip. Like, oh, really? And it just was a bit relentless, not terribly original. Uh, um, did disappointing because I'd, well, I'd kept this, you know, for uh, as a treat. It was still wrapped in plastic and I tore it off. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the artwork either. So this is art by Werther de la, de la Adera. I don't know if you can see his name. Werther de la Dera, uh, James Tinian IV is the uh, writer, I should say, and uh, um, I'd read some of his work. He's working on Batman, uh, um, more sort of main mainstream uh, comic for DC. This is Boom Comics, um, which is, where is it? yeah, Boom Comics, which is one of the independents, rather smaller, you know, Marvel DC image is probably a major player now, and there are some others sort of thing. Boom is, is, is an up-and-comer in the last however many years. Uh, um, I just didn't love the art. Um, um, you know, got fed up of the that that this is our heroine, by the way. This is Erica Slaughter, who is pictured in almost every um, every panel she appears. Um, she's got this uh, um, uh, hair over one eye, and and so if you ever see both her beautiful green eyes, uh, um, that's worth noting. But I just it was a bit weird, and there was something weird. Also, I read a lot of comic books, as you may have noticed. There was something very odd about the paneling, and there, you know, there's there's an the way comics are structured, you have to be able to follow the story. You know, the whole thing is, you know, Will Eisner's done loads of great work and also Scott McDonald great work on, on the gutters, the that white space between panels and what that means. In, you know, you can go from one panel to another, it can be 20 years or it can be a split second or it can be the same thing we did in one of you. And it's, there's a vocabulary of uh, um, the way comic book panels are structured that one becomes familiar. You have to become a, a, a reader. It's not all just bam, pow, a uh, thing. That's That's part of it. The paneling in this comic was very weird. Sometimes it goes across two pages, which is fine. You can have double spread, and sometimes it goes, you know, down one page and then down the other page. Um, and then sometimes it was hard to work out what was going on. It wasn't it, it, it's sort of kind of experimental, but I don't think always successful. So that was a little obstacle as well. It's just like I'm used to reading comics, and the fact that sometimes I was lost on the page where I was supposed to be going next was not a great feeling. So derivative. Uh, um, it's not a not, yeah, not a failure of experimentation, but experimental in ways that didn't that sort of frustrated me, um, and just okay. Uh, uh, something's killing the children. Book one. I'm not sure I need to read uh, beyond this. This uh, I don't have any issues up to. This is the first fifteen. I think it must be up to issue late twenties now. Or they must be ready to do another one of these fifteen 
uh, together, but unless I found it super cheap, uh, I mean, they look so beautiful. This is, I don't know, you can see this, this is beautifully embossed with a thing. I, I wouldn't necessarily pick up another one. Okay, after that, uh, back to the world of modern literary fiction. I read Ali Smith's companion piece, um, which is, I got this in hardback, it's sort of naked uh, hardback up here with this, um, the dust cover is like a half dust cover. Uh, um, so that's that's what's going on there. Um, uh, and the print is uh, quite large and well spaced. So for a 240 page book, this was a very um, whizzy, fun read. I, I just, I, I, I know there are some people, some people on BookTube who are not vibing with Ali Smith. Uh, um, I seem to just enjoy everything that she's done. I know um, uh, uh, Ros at Scally Dandling Land Books read the, um, uh, um, the seasonal quartet, and this is supposed to be a, uh, a companion piece to that seasonal quartet, which I was you know, just crazy for. Um, and this is also fantastic. So this is a book that written during the pandemic and touches on the pandemic in ways that we're going to be sick to death of i think 30 years from now people writing about the pandemic are authors coming into their prime remembering their childhood or their formative years and uh, we're going to there's going to be an endless supply uh, um, of uh, books in the future uh, writing about the pandemic this is right in the pandemic and immediately after the pandemic this came out last year uh, um, and it's just a, a just a wholly human humane um, bit of writing um, there's a little bit of, of magic realism in here towards the end, which is, is, I, I haven't seen Ali Smith do before, but she she can do anything and it just feels so emotionally intelligent and smart and and just to me so I just lapped this up, wept a little bit and thoroughly enjoyed uh, Ali Smith's companion piece. I know she's not for everyone. I don't I don't understand why, because I think it's so good i'm sorry my, my my critical faculties failing me there it's good stuff uh, i really enjoyed this ali smith's companion piece then after that another novel this is one is in translation this is the memory monster by ishai sarid an israeli uh, writer his father is a famous um, um israeli politician yossi sarid uh, this is translated from the hebrew by yarden greenspan um first published in hebrew in 2017 i think this was published in uh, translated and published in america uh, in 2020 and 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 uh, uh, recently published in the UK. So that's, I picked this up over uh, when I was in the UK over the, the New Year's um, and I got it half price. So this was um, supposed to be 12 99 uh, in hardback, new hardback, and I got this half price, so that's £6.50, which is a great price for uh, uh, an untried um, novelist. So, um, uh, you know, I like, I, I, I've lived in Israel several years now, many decades, um, and I don't read enough. Israeli authors and so if I have an opportunity I know I want to read more so that was why I picked this up uh, when I saw it in the half price sale in London um great really really good uh, interesting work maybe very there's a specific specificity uh, uh, about it that maybe I appreciated more as an Israeli what is the memory monster um, um this is narrated by a uh, narrator it's a series of letters written by the protagonist who is has a PhD in the Holocaust um and um uh, spends his time mostly in Poland leading tours of um, the death camps uh, and uh, when he comes home to his child uh, um, who's from whom he's absent and his mother have to explain why he spends most of the time because in between tours he just stays in Poland the next door come that's that's how he uh, um, gets paid um, uh, and he explains to his child that he is uh, um, fighting monsters and the child's the real monsters because no memory monsters uh, um, that's a that thing I'm not, I don't think it wholly works the um, the metaphor of the title but what this touches on is um, this industry is a strong word I don't want to even, it has been uh, 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 as a pejorative sense to it but this world that exists around uh, uh, memorializing and remembering the Holocaust, um, and this is not an, it's not a negative. It's not a, it's not a um, a cynical. It's not a satire. It is about uh, the damage that does, and the and the um, the way that it impresses itself on the psyche of a people, particularly the Israeli people. So one of the things he does, and he gets uh, over time gets enormously fed up of, is he takes school groups around the camps in Poland, um, concentration camps. And this is a thing that if you're if you live in Israel, if you've been an Israeli parent, this is something that schools do. All three of my children, I think all three of them, all three of them went on 
school organized trips when they were about 16, 17, uh, um, uh, were taken to Poland and put on buses and taken from camp to camp and then back to the hotel and, and given lectures and, and uh, meet with Holocaust survivors while they're there who sometimes accompany them to the camps. And it is a whole world uh, where the Israeli government puts money into this, the Israeli government in, 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 can, uh, works together with the Polish government, and the, that relationship has been fraught over the last few years. But uh, uh, they just both sides have just both reinvested and said they're going to carry on doing, going to carry on doing um, these tours, and it's a big uh, 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 thing. And kids come, and in Israel, one of the reasons why they've invested and they think it's a good thing for school children age 16 17 to go out and and do organized trips to visit the concentration camps is it's part of jewish identity part of israeli identity because remember these 16 17 year olds are 18 months two years away from being conscripted into the uh, uh, israeli army uh, and there is uh, a a very clear connection is attempted uh, um, to be made to these uh, uh, impressionable children and I say this as someone who's all three of my children went and it's not like the school to I paid you know it's 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 subsidized but parents pay to send their kids so I'm, I'm mea culpa on 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 participating in this uh, uh, but the connection is made between the fragility of life uh, um, for Jews in Europe and uh, the responsibilities of young Israelis before they go into the army. It's it, it's a very complicated subject. I don't think I'm doing it justice here. I think the book does a terrific job of parsing out these things, of, of questioning uh, uh, um, whether we should be doing this, of trying to understand you know, whether or not children, children, teenagers, should be going out to visit the concentration camps. That doesn't invalidate the horror of what happened there and our duty to remember and reject the, uh, uh, um, that sort of vile genocidal intent that, that there are some people uh, for whom it occurred in their lifetimes. But this is a, a book that uh, uh, looks at this with questions uh, um, uh, and you know, uh, over time the uh, narrator who turns out he's narrating um, his story to his former boss at Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum uh, in the hills outside Jerusalem, which I urge everyone, uh, if you ever come to Israel, you should visit it. It's, it's uh, um, a very well curated, uh, uh, very smart, understands all the issues about memorializing the Holocaust, I think better than I've been able to explain here. But that's in the, the, um, uh, the premise of the story is he's narrating it to his boss, who is uh, uh, one of the bosses at Yad Vashem. And we see a kind of breakdown after spending so much time around death and memory and, and the stories of genocide, the impact on this individual and uh, the implication, I guess, how it Im impacts all of us who live with this idea that this is the ex existential threat on which our lives today still uh, um, need to base uh, um, some of our philosophies and thoughts and beliefs. Uh, uh, the Memory Monster by Yishai Sarid, I, I, I don't think I've done it justice. It's, it's, it's 170 pages. Uh, it's not, um, I don't think it's, it's inaccessible anyway. I think it's very readable. I think it's smart. I don't think it has answers, but it's really good at asking questions, which I think is, is a good thing. And, and asking questions not because you're trying to undermine something or destroy something, and these are the questions. But just asking questions because we must continue to ask questions about everything we do and not take everything necessarily at face value. Good stuff. Uh, the Memory Monster, Yishai I read, I really enjoyed that. Uh, uh, and that was that. And then after that, I'm reading next. So so, um, uh, so I spoke about with Mick Heron going back and reading his early stuff. I'm still uh, uh, going through uh, Kay Atkinson's uh, earlier works. This is the third i think in the jackson Brody series so you know i read kate atkinson way back um uh, when she first uh, came out her first novel won the whitbread award i think behind the scenes at the museum uh, and i read that and i read another one after that and then i skipped all the jackson Brodies and came back to her for those um uh, uh, the time travel -y ones or the was it life after life and uh, and that sequel and i've read another one of hers and then i decided i'd go back because i'd watched the jackson Brody. Uh, shows when they're on the BBC with uh, uh, Hello to Jason Isaacs um, uh, and I enjoyed them so I thought I would go back and read them so I've been uh, pasting them out this one's from 2008 this is the uh, the third in the Jackson Brody series when will there be good news they're not um, traditional uh, detective stories by any stretch but but readable and uh, in my efforts to reduce my TBR uh, and not buy new books I'm still um, going through these so that was a long catch up uh, thanks very much take care God bless bye